Welcome to episode 20 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're broadcasting live from Maplewood, Minnesota. Let us know where you're watching from, and as always, if you have questions during the, sh the show, get them in before we go to break. Today we're talking to Pat Watson, uh, also known as Hazmat Pat, uh, about <laughs> storing hazardous materials. Uh, so we're going to actually cover hearing protection, hazardous material storage, and environmental hazards in shooting. Stick around. Welcome to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I'm your host, Sarah Houtman. Today we're talking about probably the single most underrated topic in the shooting world, and that's environmental hazards. We're going to cover everything from hearing protection to lead exposure to storage of hazardous materials in your home. And if you've ever been curious about what happens uh, to a brick of primers in a house fire, today you will find out. Our expert guest today is Pat Watson, also known as Hazmat Pat. Pat is a native Minnesotan and a resident of Mendota Heights. Professionally, he advises and consults with companies on the global shipment of dangerous goods. Pat's an avid shooter and hunter, as well as an aficionado of Labradors and fine whiskeys, as the two go well together when enjoying a campfire at the end of a long day. Thanks a lot for joining us, Pat. Hey, I'm really happy to be here, sir. Thank you, and thanks to the caucus for putting this on. Well, we are glad to have you. So we've got kind of a lot of stuff to cover, so I kind of want to jump right into it. Let's start with hearing protection. So let's say, um, say you're just going hunting. You only go out, you know, for one day a year. Is it okay to just fire a couple shots uh, without hearing protection? What do you think on that? Oh, man. Um everybody's got this story of their grandpa or great uncle or somebody like that. And they're always like, eh, eh, what, what, you know, and they, they have trouble hearing you. And it's, it's because, you know, you've gotten those a couple of uh, gunshots in your life. And I, I think we're probably all guilty of it from time to time. You come onto the range, you think it's cold. All of a sudden there's a shot and you're like, ah, I forgot to put my ears on, you know, you quick throw your ears on, or maybe, maybe you've got them off a little bit or something like that right when you're on the line and, um, and you get, get a blast of one. Um, it, it can take as little as one gunshot to cause permanent hearing damage. Um, it's, it's so vitally, vitally important that, that percussive high decibel level. I mean, uh, gunshots are 140 plus decibels. Um, you can have immediate hearing damage from that. And so it's it's really, really important that you wear those hearing protection um, every single time. And hunting was one thing I struggled with for a long time because I used to go duck hunting with folks and holy cow, I mean, that boat would light up at a flock of ducks coming into the decoys and it would be like, everybody would be like, eh, what, what, what'd you say? Lunch? No, I don't, no, it's not lunchtime yet. What are you talking about? You know, and, <laughs> We all couldn't hear each other for a while, and um, you know, God, this is a long time before um, before the electronic hearing protection got uh, affordable. But now that electronic hearing protection is affordable, I bought some for my kids. I have it. I wear it all the time. I convinced my brother-in-law that it's a good idea. I mean, I, I I advocate for it with everybody. I'm just like get the get the plugs, get the muffs that are electronic. Heck, you can hear what's going on around you so much better, anyways. Um, and it, it really just takes that one shot, literally, to, lure, to ruin your hearing for the rest of your life. So it's, it's a tough subject for a lot of guys. A lot of guys are just like, ah, I can get it out. It's fine. I feel better after a little while. And I was like, does it ring when you, when you shoot? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, that, that's damage. That's hearing damage. So, 
Yeah, so my understanding is that hearing damage is cumulative and permanent. So like one shot today, you might not notice a difference. And one shot next year, you might not notice a difference. But like 30 years from now, you're going to notice a difference. <laughs> so it's like, why, I, you know, why subject yourself to that? I'm, I'm feeling my age this week for a lot of things. And hearing is, is definitely one of them. I... You know, my kids shout at me about something or are talking to me about something and all I hear is mumbling or I have to go, what, what'd you say? You know, and, and that's, that's me having hunted for, you know, my twenties and thirties without hearing protection. And it's, it, it's not necessary. You don't have to go through this. You can, there are so many good affordable options out there these days. Um, you can, you know, you can, uh, you can find one that, that works for your uh, hunting style, your budget and everything else. Yeah, and you're you're a young guy to be suffering from that already. And I know I got my ears checked a while back, mm. and uh, I had like a slight dip in my right ear, right in that frequency that shooters have problems with. And I think it's actually from mm. shouldering rifles, where it kind of bumps your ear pro off. Um, that's nope. my best guess. Nope. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I... the the other thing I I kind of think is interesting about it is like sometimes people don't notice the hearing damage right away because it doesn't affect the like decibel level of most of the voices you hear all it really does is um like the s and the t sounds like those high-pitched sounds you start to lose those so then which kind of sounds like charlie brown's mom and that's a lot harder to yep. notice because you feel like you can still hear it's just harder to understand uh what's actually being it's said. also harder it's harder to pick them up when you're in a crowd too. So when there's a lot of people talking oh, yeah. at the same time, um, one thing I've noticed is that you have trouble picking out. So I'm talking to the person next to me, but every single other person is talking and it's really hard to keep that conversation with that person I'm having sometimes um, in, you know, hearing it without, without turning towards them with my ear so that I can actually hear what they're saying. And you know, it's, it's so avoidable. I mean, I, I double up when I'm at the indoor ranges. Mm -hmm. um, I double up uh, if I'm going to be outdoors and there's a bunch of guys on the line, I will absolutely double up. I'll put in the foam plugs and my muffs. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm good to go. I haven't had a dip now in my hearing. I had my hearing checked uh, last year and I haven't had a dip for probably five or six years now. So I'm doing okay, but it's yeah, definitely so something to think of. Double plugging is working, that sounds like. Okay, so so let's talk about options for hearing protection. So is uh, sure. is one better than the other? Are earmuffs better? Are earplugs better? And how do you know if what you're getting is good? Well, um, I always start with kind of the bottom, which is the the plastic muffs, the Mickey Mouse ears, the the big the big C, C cups that uh, we all probably grew up with. Um, those are probably your... I'm not going to say worst option, but they're lowest on the rung. So you're getting somewhere between 20 and 25 decibels of attenuation. So it's, it's, um, it's bringing that, so that 140 decibel exposure, it's going to bring it down to 120. 120 is still enough that you can get damage. So mm -hmm. this is where I go back to people with muffs and especially like you were talking with muffs, some of the, some of the problems with them, like when you're shouldering a rifle is they come up off your ear when you're down on that cheek weld. And that's, that's not doing you any good. You don't get any points for style just wearing the muffs <laughs> if, they're, if they're off your ear even a little bit or if they're old and the plastic has gotten hardened. I mean, we've all got that, that set of muffs that's hanging on the wall in our garage that we use for lawn mowing or something like that. And, you know, that plastic gets really, really hard and brittle over time and it, it doesn't conform to the side of your head as well, especially if, if you're people like us who've got glasses right. and you got to get that um, – that, that seal. So again, that's why I double up because if you want to move up to the next option, the next option is the foam plugs. Uh, there's actually rubber plugs too. You can get rubber plugs too. Um, and I'll just include, you know, ear plugs in the same uh, genre here because you're between 22 and 33 decibels of reduction, actually. Some of the higher end foam plugs, you know, the ones that you roll and, and you got to wear them properly because I've seen Range duty, I go out to Oakdale and I'll be on range duty. And I'll see people with those foam plugs and they literally take the whole plug and try to stuff it in their ear as hard as they can. Mm. And, you know, 90% 90, 90 of it's hanging out the side. You got to roll it between your fingers, pull your ear over and insert it to get it into the ear canal where it's actually going to swell and do some good. Um, but plugs, yeah, yeah. foam plugs, I think are, are going to do you better than the rubber plugs. There's the rubber plugs that look, um, 
they've got the little baffles on them. Uh, they oh, usually yeah, have a I've neck cord those. or something that you hang around. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you got the rubber plugs too. Those will be a little less on the attenuation than the foam plugs. Your best option is going to be a custom fit one. Um, uh, there's a few companies out there that are doing custom fit plugs right now where they send you a kit and you actually shoot your ear full of like a rubber foam and then you pull it out uh, and send it back to them and then they make a mold for you based off of that um, that cast of your ear, so to speak. They make a mold and they cast a custom earplug for you and they come in electronic options. They come in um, non-electronic options. I mean, those are conformal Custom conformal earplugs are going to be about your best. That's going to be the 30 plus uh, decibel reduction rating. And of course, everybody should just buy a can. I mean, put a silencer <laughs> on the end of your gun. That That's, you know, that's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. I remember back in 2015 when we were all kind of working together to get that uh, suppressor bill passed in Minnesota. I remember doing a ton of research on hearing protection and and over and over again, I even from like government sources like the the CDC and uh, OSHA, over and over again, they kept saying the best way to protect your hearing is to reduce the volume of the sound at the source because there's only so much you can do even with earplugs and earmuffs. There's only so much you can do if your gun is so loud that it like overpowers all the protection that you're getting. So yeah. I, I'm totally on board with you there. That's That's a great thing to do if you can do it. Personal protective equipment is is actually the last step. Minimizing the sound at the source when you're talking like in an industrial setting, that's your first step is minimizing the environmental noise as as best you can. Mm. So, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense for sure. Okay, Uh, so let's talk um, a little bit about purchasing options. Do Do you have an idea of what somebody should expect to spend on a good ear protection? Oh man, uh, I was just looking at a set of custom plugs that were custom electronics that were like two seventy nine. Um, mm-hmm. I'm I am not an expert at that because you know you get all the way from two hundred seventy nine bucks, like I said, for the custom electronic plugs. Uh, it's you can buy decent uh, electronic muffs right now that are going to run you probably right around sixty, seventy, eighty bucks. I think for the Peltors, the three Ms. Mm. Uh, you can get a special. There's a Black Friday special I just saw. I think the Howard Light uh, ones are on Black Friday special on Amazon again. Um, I might be mistaken on that. I can't remember where, where I saw them, but um, so you can find those. You know, anywhere 30, 39, 40 bucks, all the way up to about 100 for the electronic muffs. Um, you do get what you pay for because on the lower end ones, they're going to clip off a lot of sound. So, like if you and I are talking to each other at the range, um, you're going to. I, your gun, mm. it's going to sound more like that versus like the high end 3Ms, Peltors, you're going to get, um, hey, Sarah, how's it going? And then in the background, there's going to be a gunshot that's going to mute out, but you and I are still going to be able to have a conversation. So you definitely gotcha. get what you pay for there. And the little foam plugs, and, you can buy a box of 50 of them for like 10 bucks. I mean, those are, oh, yeah, those are dirt those cheap. Are cheap, cheap. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so basically with the electronic muffs, you're you're not necessarily paying for more noise reduction. You're just paying for better electronics and better speech. Uh, or they, yep. they call it, I think, noise gating, where it cuts off the noise above a certain level. But the more sophisticated ones you're saying, uh, are they just sound better. Yeah, you definitely have much better sound. Um, the newer ones have tie into Bluetooth, so you can sit there and listen to music while you're <laughs> shooting. I mean... <laughs> okay, that's that's a lot fancier than the last time I was looking. <laughs> I know, like, for me, um, so I always double plug because my ears are, like, very pain sensitive. So, like, if it's loud, it, it bothers me and, you know, causes me to flinch more and affects my shooting. Um, yeah. So I've always I've always kind of just gotten the habit of, of double plugging from early on. Um, and for me, what I found works really well is, uh, so I, I do just the cheap foamies, with the, the 32 or 33 decibel noise reduction underneath. And then I looked around and I tried to find the loudest amplification I could find in electronic muffs so that I could still hear decently, even with the foamies in. And it's like, it's a little quieter than, than normal speech. Um, but it's still, you know, pretty usable. Like if you're at a class and you need to hear range commands and, and uh, it, it's, it's very usable, even though it's, double layers of stuff stuffed in your ears it still works out pretty well oh, yeah. so yeah my my electronic muffs i have the peltors and um when i'm at stock and barrel shooting with a friend well back in the days before covid 
uh, when I was there shooting with a friend and I'd have, whenever I'm shooting indoors, I always double up. I always have the plugs and the muffs just because it's just, there's noise bouncing off the ceiling and the walls and behind me and in front of me and everything else. Um, I put the, put the muffs or the plugs in and then I put my muffs over the top. And like you said, mine, when I turn them all the way up, I turn the gain and the volume all the way up. I can hold a normal conversation with the guy I'm shooting with or the person I'm shooting with. And it, you know, like you said, it's just a hair softer than normal. So. Yeah. Yeah. I ended up trying a bunch of different kinds until I found one that actually was like too loud without the extra set of plugs. <laughs> yeah. Like, these yeah. are the ones. Cause once I get the plugs in there, then it's perfect. Yeah. Yep. And on the cheaper ones. So I have noticed like on the cheaper champion and some of the other um, like Chinese knockoff ones, when you go to indoor ranges, you end up getting a lot of the echo cut off. So, oh. you know, like when there's a, there's a percussive gunshot, it should knock the top off of that sound, um, sound peak and cut it off from getting into your ear. But then when that sound echoes around inside it, mm -hmm. it, 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 that's where, when you and I would be talking, we'd have cut, I, it, nothing happened. It, it, you gotcha. get that because the computer, the little computer chip in there is picking out way too many different sounds. So, so it cuts off too much. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Any advice you'd give someone uh, uh, who's kind of looking into this for the first time, maybe a new shooter, uh, maybe they have access to like Fleet Farm or kind of like a basic uh, store, anything in particular they should look for? You know, um, just about every indoor range or outdoor range is going to have uh, foam plugs available to you. They may charge you 50 cents or a buck uh, for a small pair or for a pair of them. Um, I'd really look into either the Howard lights or I just, I love the 3M, the Peltors. Those are phenomenal. And there's, there's so many good ones out there. And again, like I said, you get what you pay for. So it resist the urge to buy the 29 or the $19 pair that you see on, on special at Fleet Farm or something like that. Um, they, they might do what, what you want, but typically they actually have a very, very low noise reduction rating. So the mm -hmm. ones I saw at Fleet Farm the other day were 22 decibels reduction. They were $29.99, electronic, Bluetooth, you know, up, 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 up. But 22 decibels is taking you from 140 down to 118, which again, you're still damaging hearing. So I'm like, you, you can double up and stuff, but again, you're getting what you pay for there. So I'm not, I'm not real thrilled with the low end on those, no. Yeah, that seems fair. Yeah, it's almost like uh, you you almost get like kind of a false sense of security with something like that because you're still in the danger range yeah. even though you're technically like you're wearing ear pro. Uh, yeah, is there I've a, seen a lot of folks do that. Yeah, is there a is there a minimum you say like don't buy anything that's less than X decibels? Um, I mean, just about everything that's on the market these days is going to be at least twenty two. Um, even the cheapest earmuffs you buy in like the tool section um they're all going to be i think i think that's the minimum so it, it it they don't really sell i mean i've i have seen some people at outdoor ranges wearing like uh furry earmuffs like like for warming their ears and i'm like that oh. that, that doesn't actually do it that doesn't do anything so i'm oh, like <laughs> i can hope you have your plugs underneath I, those at least <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually went up to one guy who had them on, and I, he had the little behind-the-neck ones on, and I, I was like, you have plugs on underneath there, right? And he's like, what? And I was like, okay, never mind. <laughs> Yikes. Oh, man. All right, so one last question before we take our first break here. Uh, are there any different considerations for kids? So if your kids are shooting with you, um, do they need any additional or different type of protection, or are the recommendations different? No, I mean, you absolutely want to make sure that they are wearing it properly. That's the key mm -hmm. there. Um, when my kids were little, they'd have them, you know, up and, and kitty wampus and, and mm -hmm. all kinds of things when they would have them on. And the plugs were really hard for them to get in properly and they were squirmy. And so it was really hard to get them in. And um, I ended up springing for a pair of these just gigantic C cup. Um, like the air, aircraft uh, mechanic ones that oh, you see right. from the guys out on the tarp, just like, tarmac whoop. and they got, yeah. And they got the really, really squishy foam on them. And I was like, hold still, whoop, you know, <laughs> stick them on the kid's head. And it, it's, it's just like finding a gun stock or, you know, equipment or something like that for your kids. You want to find something that they're going to be able to use properly where it's going to be comfortable for them so that they're going to want to keep it on. Um, 
yeah, it's 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 really really important that you don't get that hearing damage young because then yeah. it's with them their whole life. So right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Well, you are watching Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. So we're talking to Pat Watson. We just covered hearing protection. We're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about lead exposure. Stick around. Hi, it's Brian Strauser, chairman of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We are a single issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and the shooting sports. Please consider joining us as a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month, or choose one of our other annual membership options. You can learn more about us at gunowners.mn and become a member at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're talking to Hazmat Pat Watson about environmental hazards of shooting. So we just covered hearing protection. Up next, we're going to talk a little bit about lead exposure. And Pat, I'm going to start you off with the same question. Who cares? Why should we care? So it's like, maybe we just go shooting once a month. Is lead exposure really that big a deal? Well, it's it's a tough one because there's... Lead, lead is a toxic metal. I mean, I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm a chemist by training. That's what I've been doing for 20 years. Lead is a toxic metal. Um, that said, it's it's all about the dose. So toxicity is in the dose. I think Socrates, said, one of the Greek philosophers, said um, you, you take toxins in your body all the time and they don't really affect you until you get a dose, until you get a therapeutic dose. And so it's all about that dose. Lead is a tough one because it is cumulative, kind of like the hearing protection thing we just finished. Um, lead is cumulative. Your body does not detoxify lead very, very well. Um, it, it's excreted through your endocrine system, um, down out through your digestive system. Um, and it, it, it's hard for people to get that out. And if once it's in your body, it tends to stay there for a long, long time. In fact, once you get high enough, it won't detoxify until you undergo a very, very painful uh, therapy called chelation therapy, where they actually uh, precipitate it out of your tissues and your blood and everything else. So it, it can be pretty nasty. And again, repeated exposure is going to be a whole lot worse than one time exposure. So, you know, just, you know, being exposed to a single lead bullet once upon a time, and then you went and had a candy bar probably isn't going to hurt you. But when you are shooting at the range and having a smoke or you're touching your face or you're then going home and hugging your kids or you're eating dinner after that and you're having finger food beforehand and having, you know, so it's um, it's it's cumulative. That's definitely what you want to watch for. So you can do things to reduce that at the front end. You know, I heard uh I heard that lead exposure can actually build up in your body and tissue, like including building up in your bones. And even when you start to detox, it's still there, just kind of hanging out in your bones. And then when you get stressed, it starts to release. So you can actually end up, even though you might feel fine for a while, you can end up uh, with your body kind of giving you a toxic dose uh, just due to like stress and environmental factors. Yeah, it definitely hangs out in certain body tissues, fat tissue, bone, um, some other things like that. And it will release over time. You actually will have people who uh, were exposed to lead uh, painters, for example, back in the 70s, 80s, uh, people doing building remodeling. Um, let's see, folks in the battery industry, uh, professional shooters, you know, people who work at indoor ranges. Um, they won't have had exposure for... Uh, years and then all of a sudden they lose a lot of weight. Let's say they go on keto or they decide, you know, they're going to lose a ton of weight and they lose 25, 35, 45 pounds. Um, all of that uh, lead all of a sudden is now active in your body and is present and becomes uh, therapeutic, becomes uh, not therapeutic, uh, pharmacologically active. And so it, yeah, it, absolutely. You can go toxic from lead years after the initial exposure, depending on how repeated and how massive that initial exposure was. So it kind of pays to maybe just have some some 
careful habits early on and just follow those throughout your shooting career, maybe. Yeah, yeah so um, good hygiene. Oh, no, no, please, please talk about hygiene. Well, I was going to say good hygiene is is something that all shooters should should work towards. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. Um, it starts with no hand to mouth contact. All right. So if you're going to be um, shooting, you're going to be reloading, you're going to be handling bullets, you're going to be brass picking, you're going to be cleaning guns. Um, no hand to mouth. OK, I mean, how uh, that's not that hard to do. You go to the range, don't bring anything to eat or drink with you. Don't have a smoke. You know things like that, and wash your hands when you're done. There's so there's a, a simple solution right there. Go ahead. I have a two part question for you on on that topic. Okay. Uh, so first part is that my understanding is that lead is a lot worse for kids than it is for adults. Can you comment on that at all? Oh, it's way worse for kids. Um, kids are still developing their nervous system. Their brains are still developing. And lead is neurologically toxic, so it does affect the brain and the nervous system. And so, you know, depending on when the exposure occurred, this is why lead paint chips were such a big deal for kids for such a long time. Um, you get that ne young neurological exposure and it can affect them for years. You can see a marked decrease in IQ based on their dosage early. Their adult IQ could be down by, you know, several dozen, 20, 30 40 points even, depending wow. on what the quantity of their exposure was. It, it, it can be quite dramatic and they, they don't detoxify very well either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, they detoxify even less well, excuse me, the infants or uh, children and the elderly actually detoxify less well than adults do, adults which don't detoxify well at all. So it can be quite, uh, quite dramatic. There was actually a uh, folk, uh, I won't call him a friend. We'll call him an associate of mine who uh, had a child who had really high blood lead. He was uh, having trouble. It was a, uh, let's see, he's a one-year-old and wasn't walking, wasn't doing um, normal cognitive steps for a one-year-old. And they took him to the doctor. The doctor ran a blood test on the child and found high lead. And they said, well, what's the plumbing like in your house? Oh, it was a brand new house. No lead plumbing, no lead solder. Okay, so it's a brand new house. Wouldn't have lead paint. No, it doesn't have lead paint. And the doctor finally was like, wait a second you shoot? And the guy's like, oh yeah, I go to the range once a week with my buddies and you know, we shoot all the time and all this kind of stuff. And the doctor goes, aha, he's like, do you have carpeting in your house? Yep. I got carpeting. Yeah, I do. So when the guy would go shoot, he'd come home and he'd walk across the carpeting and just the amount of lead that was on his shoes from shooting once a week was enough to leave enough on the carpeting where the child was crawling across and, you know, kids put everything into their mouths and was starting to get uh, neurological effects from lead. So they ran the kid through, unfortunately, had to run him through chelation therapy and uh, got the lead out of his system. But, you know, they're still waiting to kind of see what's going to happen with um, with the child as it grows up here. So definitely something oh. to think about with kids. Yeah, that's a huge bummer. So that's the second part of my question then. Kids are always, you know, hand to mouth, hand to mouth. Um, so what precautions should you take as the adult before you come home to your family? So what, what do you recommend people do? Yeah, I, so my, my, re, uh, my regime is, uh, I actually have a set of shooting shoes and a set of, uh, shooting clothing when I go to an indoor range and the shooting shoes and the shooting clothing, uh, don't, uh, come into the house. So I leave them in the garage. I leave them somewhere where uh, my kids, my family aren't going to come into contact with them. Um, and that's, that's my deal. I also make sure that I'm washing my hands. I use um, like these lead wipes. You can see these, uh, there's a couple of different brands of them. I happen to have the hoppies ones, uh, but you get those at some of the ranges. They'll have those and definitely use those to get that lead off even before you, you leave the range. So Somebody just commented on those yeah. lead cleanup wipes too. I just saw. So yeah, they're these things are excellent. They actually have a chemical that pulls that lead off your hands and pulls it into solution on the wipe. Uh, you should always use two wipes. This is another oh. thing too. Just uh, chemical background. The first one pulls it into solution, so your hands are still wet, and then the second one wipes it off. Oh, so see, I've been doing that wrong. Too. Okay, good to know. Hmm. I mean, one is better than none, but but you know, two is one, one is none. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is this is a great episode because I'm learning things. <laughs> That's always yeah, a win. Yeah, and heavy shooters, heavy shooters, people who are doing a ton of like competitive shooting and everything else, especially if they're indoors, uh, they should actually consider laundering their clothing separately from their families. 
Um, I, I know one competitive shooter that actually goes to a commercial laundry. They take their shooting clothing and they take it to a commercial laundry to wash it. They don't even uh, wash it in their own home washer. For an occasional shooter, I think that, that and I, I, I can't speak for everybody and I don't know what the exact number is for what, you know, how many rounds an occasional shooter would shoot where you don't have to worry about, you know, your home laundry, but it's definitely a thing. If you are going to be doing a lot of shooting, that um, residue, that lead oxide residue from the primer and from the bare base of the bullet um, is going to get onto your clothing. And it, 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 it doesn't just disappear as soon as you get home, it's there. And so if you put it in the laundry with your kids' clothes, it's going to be, some of it's going to be on their clothing too, especially when it comes out Then they're going to put it on. So Again, oh, it's yeah. cumulative. It's not one event. It's cumulative. So anything you oh, can okay. do to help minimize that is going to be better. Yeah, that just sounds like kind of good sense. Okay. Uh, so yeah. another question. I'm assuming, does, does this have the same effect on your pets? Like, you know, your pets are walking on the carpet and putting things in their mouths too. I'm assuming it would have a pretty similar effect on them. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, stories of dogs who are like range dogs at the range who go out and dig in the berms and stuff like that and then end oh. up dying from lead poisoning. Oh, so sad. it's, yeah. Oh, it's terribly sad. Yeah. And I mean, they would have, I mean, essentially the same thing as like a child, right? I mean, a 60 pound Labrador is, is essentially the same as a kid. They're chewing on their paws all the time. Mm. So yeah. Absolutely. That's a good, a good point. You would want to take, uh, take good care of them as well. All right. So then when you're shooting, um, where does this lead come from and how does it get on you? So then maybe you kind of can understand how, you know, to minimize your risk. Sure. So lead comes from two places, uh, either the bullet or the primer. Primers contain a compound, modern primers contain a compound called lead stiffnet which uh, when it uh, ignites uh, becomes lead oxide or some various lead oxides, oxides of lead, um, which are a solid, but they're like a vapor form. And over time, they will settle out on hard surfaces or settle out on surfaces. And so when you're shooting, you're going to get a little bit back on you. You get it on your hands. You get some other things like that. Same thing with bare base bullets. I don't know if anybody's ever shot um, like a bare base bullet versus one that's got like a gas check or a fully encapsulated base and you get that great big cloud of smoke that comes out when you're shooting those bare base bullets, that's vaporized lead. That's literally molten vaporized lead coming out. Uh, it could be dirty powder too, but <laughs> it, yeah, it, it's it, it, all things then. being same. It's, it's, it's going to be vaporized lead. And so uh, a couple of ways to minimize your exposure because there really aren't a ton of non-lead primer loads out there. There are some. So you have like federal Syntec, um, I think Remington has one. I can't remember what it's called though, unfortunately, um, that are like a non, um, non lead based primer. So that's one thing. And then they also fully encapsulate them. So they do what's called like a total metal jacket or a synthetic jacket or a polymer jacket, um, or they do a reverse draw. So like actually jacketed hollow points, since they're a reverse draw, the cup actually has the core like this and the cartridge is going to hit the, the base end of the cup. That actually doesn't have an exposed base either, but but traditional full metal jackets where you have the cup, the core, and then the, the cartridge hits the bare lead, that's where you end up getting a lot of the vaporized lead from. So those are things yeah. you can minimize just yourself is to shoot total metal jacket, fully encapsulated, synthetic jacketed, reverse drawn, um, and look for a non-lead based primer if one exists. Again, Federal Syntec was a great one for that. And it's not, I don't work for them anymore, so I get nothing out of this, um, but that was that was a really great round for indoor shooting. Yeah, that's that's kind of a great round anyway. I always really like that one. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, oh shoot, you know, I just had a great question and now I have forgotten it. <laughs> it was right along those lines, though. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. Okay, so uh, so you shoot the bullet leaves your barrel and along with this cloud of smoke and part of that mm -hmm. smoke, a component of that smoke is is vaporized lead. Uh, do you mm -hmm. recommend that people use respiratory protection or is that more for if you're like a really heavy indoor shooter? Oh boy, uh, that is a tricky one. So a lot of ranges do a very, very good job of what's called like um, direction, directional airflow. So if mm -hmm. you're ever at like Stock and Barrel or Bills or a couple of the other indoor ranges, you'll feel that that breeze coming back from your neck going forward. And that's because the the 
outlets are behind you and the intakes are downrange. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to directional uh, get the get the airflow going in one direction away from the shooters. So I think they do a pretty good job of that. As far as respiratory protection goes, I mean, there are really no standards for consumers. I know uh, yourself included. I know anecdotally that there have been some trainers uh, that I've known who've been doing a lot of indoor uh, training who ended up testing really, really high for blood lead levels. And once you hit a certain point, you, you really don't have any options other than to stop the exposure. And so, you know, you'll see sometimes people will be wearing like N95s or particulate respirators uh, at the range. And, you know, that's cool. If they're shooting that much indoors and that's what they need to do to protect themselves, you know, go for it by all means. Um, is it something that the occasional shooter needs? Again, that figuring out where that magic number is of rounds for the occasional shooter it, it, there's no necessarily hard and fast round for it because it's all dependent on airflow. It's dependent on the type of round you're shooting. It's depending on the, even the gun that they're coming out of. So, you know, should you wear respiratory protection at the range? Maybe that's, that's my answer to that one. Um, I don't have a hard and fast number for you on that, unfortunately. No, no, that's legit. I know my lead levels got high for a while there. Uh, when I was, I was on an indoor range for like a good three or four hours a week. Uh, and they started to get just, just a little high and I was like, oh, maybe I should get this check just to, you know, just to see where I'm at. And, uh, I was able to go to my doctor. I had to request it and I had to kind of like insist because they're not used to doing lead tests on people for like, you know, uh, for no real reason, <laughs> you know, just as like a checkup. Right. Um, and you have to kind of explain to them why you need it. And you tell them like, okay, well I shoot and I'm indoors a lot. And then they're like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. We'll order this test for you. Uh, cost about 75 bucks, I believe. And it was not covered by my insurance because it wasn't, uh, because I wasn't having having symptoms yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was something I just wanted to do. I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna see where I'm at. And then I can decide from there whether or not I need to take more precautions. And it, it did start to get a little high and I thought, okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take more precautions just because I don't want it to get any higher. Because like you I said, I know it's of a like, lot of instruct Oh it's cumulative. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, it no. Is. It's, it's, it's the lag. And, the lag's terrible. <laughs> and I know a lot of instructors who do a lot of indoor training, um, especially will actually get their blood checked a couple times a year. They'll just go in, have a blood draw at the doctor. Like you said, it's on your own dime usually. Um and that way, then they can establish what's a baseline versus what's starting to go up. And once they start to see it go up, they know that they probably need to either minimize the amount of time they have indoors or, um, you know, stop completely because it, it, it doesn't go back down again very fast. It takes a really long time to detoxify. Yeah, yeah. I did remember there were a couple guys that were like not allowed on the range at all because they just couldn't like yeah. they just weren't allowed to have any more exposure. So they just had to quit completely. So that's a huge bummer. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a couple questions here um, about reloading. So what about reloading? Are there any additional lead hazards from that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's a good question. I, I think I mentioned that was something where you want to avoid hand to mouth because there's there's um, just components. You have spent brass. If you're handling spent brass from the range, that's going to have lead residue on it. Um, if you're handling bullets, those are going to have lead. Even if they're fully encapsulated bullets, they're coming out of a facility that's got a lead plant and mm. you're probably mm -hmm. going to have lead residue on the exterior of them. If you're handling primers, if you're depriming where you're actually punching the spent primer out, you're going to be getting a lot of lead exposure in those spent primers. So when you're emptying that out, you're going to want to empty that into a, into a sealed container and keep, keep, uh, keep your waste uh, and your spent brass and things like that in sealed containers so that you're not getting dust or lead residue that's going to come out of those um, into your household or wherever it is you're reloading. And again, I don't know where people yeah. are reloading. Some people keep a separate reloading facility in their own home. Uh, some are in a garage, some are in a shed, you know, it, um, it really depends on your situation, but that's definitely something to be cognizant of is that there is lead residue when you're reloading. Um, a lot of guys uh, like to uh, put these guys on when they're doing that kind of stuff. Um, you know, don't get too, don't get too wrapped around the axle on the, on the rubber glove side of things. You can do that when you're picking brass, for example, somebody just mm -hmm. asked, there we go. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, when I'm sorting brass, I'll throw a pair of these on just because you're getting so much lead residue on the exterior of that brass. And 
I'll wash my hands when I'm done anyways. I'll take the gloves off, throw them in the garbage. I'll go wash my hands and, you know. Is there a certain kind of, of glove? Anyways. Will any glove work for this or does it like get through any, any types of materials? It's a solid. It's a particulate solid. It's not a, um, it's not a liquid or anything like that. That's going to, going to penetrate skin or anything. It doesn't really absorb through the skin or it doesn't really absorb through gloves. So really any barrier is, um, I like nitrile gloves just because I find them a little more durable than latex and honest to God with latex allergies these days, you can't really find latex gloves anywhere anymore. So yeah. Yeah. They don't sell them too much anymore. Okay. Yeah, and I think and, a box uh, of these is like, if you buy these, uh, you buy a case of these, I think they're, Less than five bucks a box for a box of what are these? A hundred? Yeah. So they're cheap. Cheap insurance. Yeah. Yeah. There's no downside there. Um, oh, and bullet casting too. I almost forgot bullet casting. Oh, yeah. So uh, bullet casting or uh, brass tumbling. Um, casting is one where you got to be really, really careful because you are actually getting that lead hot. So you are vaporizing Mm -hmm. lead right in front of you in that bullet furnace or in that melt furnace or that melt pot. And especially when you're pouring and fluxing and all that kind of stuff, that's something where you really want to do that outdoors. You want to make sure you have good airflow and you're not getting any of those vapors. If you can smell it, you're getting exposed is what I always Mm -hmm. like to tell people. And some guys are like, ah, come on. It's, you know, again, it's cumulative. Um, you're, you know, it's not a one-time deal. So just, just make sure you have good airflow and you're doing that kind of thing outdoors. Same thing with tumbling. If you dry tumble, uh, brass cases or anything like that, um, dry tumbling is a terrible source of lead dust. Uh, that media, uh, gets just full of it and it gets really dusty, especially if you're doing the sorting, um, uh, the media sort where you dump the brass into the sieve and, you know, sort, uh, drop Mm -hmm. the media out and everything else. You're generating a ton of airborne dust there. So Anything you can do to minimize your exposure, do it outdoors. Don't do that inside your home because if it gets into your HVAC system, um, mm-hmm. gets into your, you know, into your, yeah, no, not, not good. Yeah, that's, that's good to know. Definitely. All right. Anything else on lead before we go to break? Okay. So it sounds pretty simple, you know, uh, keep your hands out of your mouth, uh, be careful about your clothing and your shoes and transfer of lead from one surface to another in your home. Uh, and be careful, especially around your kids. Uh, did I miss anything on that? Uh, wear gloves when Just you can. Just be cognizant. Wear gloves when you can and be cognizant of airborne exposure, both in the range and when you're doing uh, brass prep or casting or anything like that, too. Excellent. That's great advice. All right. We're going to take a quick break. You are watching Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. So we just wrapped up our talk about lead exposure. When we come back, we're going to talk about how not to blow up your house. The Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus is a single issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the rights of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and shooting sports. Please consider becoming a Second Amendment defender, with support as low as $5 a month. You can learn more at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I'm your host, Sarah Hauptman, and we are talking to Hazmat Pat about hazardous materials, uh, hearing damage, lead exposure, and how to store hazardous materials safely in your home. So before, uh, before we start on this, Pat, I want to put a little bit of background out there for anyone who may be a new shooter. So um, when you reload your own ammo at home, what you do is you buy all the components and you put them together yourself and you make your own loaded round of ammo. And in order to do that, you, you need things like gunpowder, Uh, which is, let me get this right, gunpowder is flammable, and you need primers, which are explosive. Is that right? Close. Yeah, okay, tell me the correction. I want to know the right way. No, you you got it. Uh, Gunpowder is a, well, smokeless powder. So gunpowder refers to, like, black powder, and black powder actually is an explosive. Um, Smokeless powder is flammable. You're correct. It's a flammable solid. It's not explosive. Um. And then primers are, in fact, explosive. So, yep, you got that right. Okay, so pretty close. That's good to know. That's an interesting yep. distinction that I was unaware of. So that's cool. Uh, okay, so um, so 
one thing that I thought was interesting, and Pat and I have talked about this before, uh, is that primers have kind of different properties depending on how they're stored. And that distinction is really important if you don't want to blow things up. Uh, so Pat, what happens to a brick of primers in a house fire? And what happens to a jar of primers? And, and can you tell us a little bit about the difference between those two states? Oh, absolutely. So uh, primers, the, uh, small arms primers contain a um, small amount of an explosive mixture. It's called lead stiffnet usually. And it's if you look inside of there, um, you can see it. Sometimes it's a little bit of yellow. Uh, it's, got, it's got a yellow color. They, they actually dye it that color so they can see it when they're loading it in case it gets into places it doesn't belong. Then they can see where it is and clean it up. Um, but that small amount of explosive can, um, material inside of that cup um, is enough to set off a round of ammunition when hit by a, a firing pin. Those primers when they're packaged for shipment, um, get packaged into trays. And this is, I, I, the one prop I forgot to grab was primer trays. Um, they get packaged okay. into little trays where every single, you got, do you got one sitting there? I, I do actually. Mine are about I'm going to put 20 you... feet that way. I could go yeah. grab them. <laughs> no, you talk and I'm going to run off screen and grab them real quick. I'll be right back. All right. Well, anyways, they, they get these trays where every primer has its own little home. It's got its own little cup inside of the tray and that's designed so that the primers can't propagate from each other. So if one goes off, it doesn't set off all of them. That's the whole point behind the packaging. The packaging is what makes primers safe in that case. Um, if you have primers stored in bulk, for example, so if for some odd reason somebody would put a whole bunch of primers into a jar or into a plastic Tupperware or something like that, um, that can be a big, big problem because the primers can actually propagate then and you get what's called sympathetic detonation. So when an individual primer goes off, it goes bang. When a whole bunch of primers go off at the same time, it goes kaboom. And that is a huge issue. So Sarah's got a, a packaged brick, a factory packaged brick of primers. She's pulling a sleeve that contains a tray out. And inside that tray, you'll see our 100 federal primers. Now, federal primers, this is a funny little insider tip right there. Federal primers actually are spaced out further than any other brand because they're actually more sensitive. Oh. <gasps> they are. They're more sensitive. That's um, interesting. Does it, mean, does it mean they work better? I don't know. I'm just saying they're more sensitive. Um, so that's that. The, the packaging that she's got right there. So the tray slipped into the sleeve, slipped into the brick keeps those primers from sympathetic detonation. That's the whole point of safety right there. That's why when guys are reloading and they've got that uh, quick prime uh, tray that holds a whole tray, so you can take that entire tray she's got in her hand and dump the whole thing into the quick prime and then sit there, or the hand primer, sorry, and then squeeze the hand primer and prime your shells. Um, that's, that's a lot of primers all in one spot. Um, that's enough to literally blow your face off if they were all sympathetically detonate right there on top of each other. So definitely do not store them in bulk. Keep them in the trays like she's got right there in front of her. Um, I, I really don't know any reloader who keeps things in bulk. Even those primer tubes that you have on like progressive reloaders where you can store when you can put like 50 of them in at a time and they stack up on top of each other. Uh, most reloaders will only do that when they're planning on reloading that many. They'll they'll load their primer tube and then they'll go. They'll go through it. They won't store them like that because when you have stored 50 of them stacked up into each other, you just made a little pipe bomb. So, Oof. Yeah, yeah. What, primers what are, happens if you primers drop are a little one of those? Scary. What happens if you drop one that, of those tubes? Like how big is the kaboom? Bad. That could be bad. So uh, in another life, we did something called a bare face test where we stuck a mannequin head with a vinyl face covering on it to simulate somebody's face. And we stuck it, a, you know, two feet away from, I think it was an entire brick of primers. So a thousand primers and then detonated all thousand of them. They were in bulk. So they were basically in bulk. They weren't in the packaging like you've got there, detonated them and it blew half that head off. So uh, that was a thousand of them. I got to say, you know, 50 or a hundred is definitely going to be a bad day. There's a lot of shrapnel involved when one of those goes off too. that. There's a little anvil um, that sits inside of that cup 
that that's actually what, uh, when the firing pin hits the bottom of the cup, it pushes the cup up with that priming mix into the anvil. And that's what, um, that percussion right there, that little compression is what starts the primer going. But that little anvil is a little tiny brass piece. And that'll come flying out when those things explode. And it comes mm. flying out with a hell of a lot of velocity. And so, you know, that plus the, sometimes the cups will rupture and you get little brass fragments everywhere. It, it's bad news when those things go off, so... Definitely wear your iPro at the very least. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Reloading iPro yeah. is essential. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So uh, when I was off screen, did you talk about the, uh, you talked about the fire thing and how the fire. Oh, no, I brick? didn't. So there's a great video on YouTube. I want everybody to go Google or go look for it. It's uh, just type in Sammy, S-A-A-M-I, um, uh, ammunition and the firefighter. So oh. that video was put out by Sammy about 10 years ago. Sammy is the Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturers Institute. It's basically um, uh, the organization that encompasses all of the ammunition manufacturers in the United States. So anybody who manufactures ammo or components is part of Sammy, generally speaking. Um, and they put together this video where they uh, show what happens when ammo gets in a fire, what happens when ammo gets uh, set off outside of a gun, what happens when primers get set off outside of a gun, what happens when smokeless powder gets set off outside of a gun. It's a great video to watch. Um, but basically when primers are involved in a fire, if they're in that factory packaging, all you hear is popcorn going off. And honest to God, it sounds like somebody's making microwave popcorn. You just get pop, 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 pop. That's, that's all you get. You get a lot of pop. You don't than get kaboom. an explosion. Okay. Exactly. Even even in a, in a factory case where you have 5,000 of them, where you have five of those thousand count bricks, you're still just going to get popcorn. It's going to get really, really rapid popcorn and it's going to sound really, really disconcerting, but it's not going to go kaboom. Gotcha. It's actually the okay. same thing with smokeless powder. Smokeless powder packaging is designed to do the same thing. You may get um, a jet, a small jet of fire that's going to come out of that. But again, it's going to burn really, really dramatically. There might be a lot of white smoke that comes off of it, um, but it's not going to go kaboom. That's the that's the beauty of the packaging. The packaging is what makes these things safe. So for home storage, how does that translate into some guidelines for people who reload at home? Like, what's a good way to store your stuff? State of the factory packaging. Um, yeah. The way that it came from the factory is the best way to store it. If you have primers, if you have powder, et cetera, like that. Um, that being said, we happen to live in a state where there really aren't requirements for home storage of that stuff. I hear a lot of rumors on the internet, Facebook, everything else from people who are like, oh, you can't have more than 25 pounds. Oh, you can't have more than 50 pounds. That's not true. Not for you and me. And um, yeah. you may want to check a city with your ordinance. insurance company. Mm. Yeah, city ordinances might not work in Minnesota. <clears throat> Anyhow, that's not my fight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're, again, you live in a state that doesn't have any requirements for that as far as you and I are concerned. Um, again, mm -hmm. check with your insurance company if you're going to be storing a large quantity of it. Mm -hmm. um, only because if you ever, God forbid, were involved in a fire and you know, if an insurance investigator came out and was like, oh my God, you had 400 pounds of smokeless powder and 10,000 small arms primers. What the, well, it's two cases of small arms primers, but, um, <laughs> right. But you know, it, it, it's something we're thinking about. Otherwise, as far as storage goes, you know, keep it in a cool, dry place away from heat sources and you'll be good. What, what is a cool, dry place? I mean, everybody's been asking me that for years. Um, I always tell people, I was like, it's somewhere that's going to be away from temperature swings. It's going to be relatively consistent in temperature um, and it's going to be relatively low moisture. So if you have an area in your basement or um, an outbuilding or something like that, that's going to be, you know, fewer temperature swings. You don't want the dramatic swings from, you know, 120 degrees indoors in the summertime to minus 20 degrees in the wintertime. That plays hell on ammo, that plays hell on powder, that plays hell on primers. You're going to have consistency issues. Um, you, you may even have some failures on stuff too. So, you know, keep it consistent, keep it cool, mm -hmm. keep it dry. That's, that's, that's and, and leave it in the factory packaging yeah. away from heat sources. A lot of times this time of year on the reloading pages, I'll see guys who will have some horror story where they put a space heater in their reloading shed. And all of a sudden, you know, here's a 
here's a eight pound jug of powder that was too close to the heater and it melted and the powder caught fire and oh man there's this dramatic scorch mark and half of my room burnt down okay well you're an idiot for putting a space heater that close to an eight pound jug of smokeless propellant so yeah watch those space heaters just be sensible i guess um now i don't want to rub salt in anybody's wounds so i apologize for this question Um, but let's say hypothetically you could find some ammo and hypothetically you thought, oh, there's ammo. I'm going to stock up and get a big amount. What should people do if they do have, uh, like, you know, I don't know what you consider a large amount of ammo, but if you're storing loaded rounds in your house, are there any guidelines you should be aware of for that? Cool, dry place, free from temperature swings. Um, Mm -hmm. get it as, as consistent in temperature as you can. Get it as dry as you can and get it as consistent as you can. That's that's as most as I can tell you. There's tons of information on long-term storage for ammunition um, all over the internet. But all I'm going to tell you is there are guys, I, I still have some rounds from pre-World War II, some 30 at 6 from pre-World War II that still goes bang every time I pull the trigger. So cool. it, loaded ammunition, factory loaded ammunition is amazingly resilient. As mm-hmm. long as it doesn't get temperature swings, um, and as long as it doesn't get too wet, that's generally, it's generally going to be good. And the wetness is only so that the case doesn't start corroding. Gotcha. <laughs> Most yeah, of them are enough. sealed at both the mouth and the primer. So. so they're pretty stable, it sounds like, and not any more dangerous to store than like a tub of gunpowder. So it's like, you know, if you've got maybe some, some cases of ammo in your house, don't, you know, you don't have to panic too much about how you're storing it. No, I mean, I ask people, you know, anybody who panics about it, I'm always like, do you have a five-gallon gas can out in your garage? And they're like, yeah. I went, that is a whole lot more hazardous than um, any of this stuff. You have, I was like, do you have a 20-pound propane tank on your barbecue? You put your barbecue in your garage? Yeah. Well, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, ammunition is, is actually remarkably safe. Loaded ammunition is is remarkably safe when it comes to storage. I mean, it it's it's non-shock sensitive. You can drop it. You can throw it. There's uh, videos out there of guys taking cases of loaded ammunition. This is obviously back before the shortages, back in the mm-hmm. times of plenty, um, right. throwing it off of their roof onto a concrete driveway just to see what it would do. Same thing with cases of primers and things like that, too. And mm-hmm. nothing happens. Nothing. So it's, no, it's remarkably stable stuff. Again, as cool as possible, as dry as possible, and as consistent as possible. All right. That's good to know. Okay. And we're kind of running a little short on time, uh, but where can people go to find out more about you? About me? Oh, goodness. Um, I am a hazmat consultant, so I help people with uh, hazmat transportation, hazardous materials and transportation, uh, both in the United States and globally. Uh, I don't have a website. I work almost exclusively through word of mouth right now with my clients. So that's my deal. If they want to know more, uh, it's Patrick Watson at WatsonConsultingMN.com. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate having you on. Hey, thanks, sir. It's always a pleasure talking with you. You've been watching Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Thanks for joining us tonight. So we just wrapped up talking about environmental hazards uh, in the shooting sports. And stick around because we've got some cool episodes. Well, I shouldn't say stick around. It's not, we're done for tonight. But stick around for next week and the week after because we've got some cool stuff coming up. Uh, Next week, we're going to be talking about uh, mental health, suicide risk, and what you can do to help your friends and family. Uh, just we, we're looking at direct person to person ways that you can help your friends and family. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we can do as a community to avoid um, to avoid pushing things towards like more gun control laws and things that are less effective. There's effective things that we can do as individuals that don't require any kind of government intervention or laws. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the uh, warning signs of suicide. We're going to talk about how to talk to your friends, how to talk to your family, and things you can do to uh, offer to help them. So that's going to be uh, next week at seven o'clock on Wednesday. After that, we're going to do a holiday gift guide. So this is going to be kind of a gear and accessories show. So that's going to be a fun one. 
And uh, I believe the 16th is our last episode of the season. That's going to be competitive shooting. So we're going to interview some competitive shooters and give a little breakdown on different shooting sports that are available and how cool they are and why you should definitely do them. All right. Thanks for watching Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. If you found this show helpful, please share it with your friends. And especially if you know someone uh, who's a little bit lax about hearing protection, or if you know of a friend who stores their primers in a jar, please share this with them. Uh, you can really help them out with that. Thanks for joining us and good night.